thank you for the invitation to address you today and the opportunity to play a small part in what looks to be a very interesting conference program. I'd like to extend a special welcome to those of you visiting our city and really sincerely hope that you enjoy your stay here. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the journey for the that for the past 10 years or more, the City of Sydney has been on to create a sustainable Sydney. I hope to leave you with a sense of what we've achieved, what we've learned, and consistent with the theme of your important conference, I will share some of the underlying ideas that shape what we do and how we go about our work, with a focus on how we collaborate and partner to achieve our objectives. I will talk to you about the ways at the City of Sydney we use citizen engagement, values-based planning and targets to achieve accountability. And I will also say a few words about the roles cities are increasingly playing in tackling some of our most pressing global challenges. But I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we meet. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, especially those of, us, those of you them, who are amongst us today, and from whom we could learn a great deal about how to live sustainably on this planet. At the City of Sydney, we take this protocol very seriously because we know that we cannot achieve anything without trust, and trust can only be built on a foundation of fairness, respect, and respect. Acknowledging country shows respect, and not acknowledging country enables relationships to be built. And importantly, acknowledging country reminds us of cultures that have cosmologies that integrate people and place that connect the land the way it is described, ascribed, traversed and lived on with the human need for a sense of place, of social cohesion and of belonging, of people who transfer this knowledge, meaning and purpose from generation and to generation through the telling of stories. At the City of Sydney, we too are in the business of connecting people and place, because the city is a place. And we too are in the business of telling the stories of place because a good city plan is just that, a story. A story through which we learn about, pass on, care for, and protect what we value about our place. At the City of Sydney, we wrote down our story with our community, the 1.2 million people who live and work in the city centre each day when we developed our overarching vision, Sustainable Sydney 2030. In 2006 7 we spent 18 months in a process with tens of thousands of people and agreed a vision for the future of our local government area, which is this inner city area. We held public lectures, forums, roundtables and citizen juries, conducted statistically sound, non-self-selected surveys and informal drop-in sessions, art projects and special targeted programs for particular groups such as children. Essentially, we asked people what they valued, and then we set about developing a city that protects and enhances what people value as the city grows and changes. And of course, what we value is another way of saying the public interest. We also decided that aiming for sustainability and using the four pillars of sustainability, environment, economy, social and culture, would be our organising framework, even though we understood we needed to do a great deal of work to define exactly what achieving sustainability would mean. We were also mindful that we did not let our framework drive us further into siloed thinking, as the key to success is understanding and pursuing the co-benefits of actions. We commenced our work on Sustainable Sydney 2030 at a time when cities, what they delivered and the role they could play in tackling global challenges was receiving increasing interest. This is because the world is rapidly urbanising. Already more than 50% of the world's people live in cities or urban settlements, and of course in Australia this is much higher. Rapid urbanisation has led to many challenges, particularly in developing countries where cities are not coping with providing basic human needs, such as sanitation, water and power, let alone adequate shelter, safety and employment. Many of these problems are falling to mayors and city administrations. As a consequence, 
policy makers and planners are turning their minds to these questions and finding they have to find new ways of tackling these challenges. This has led to some very influential city alliances that the City of Sydney is a part of, such as the Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities and the C40, which is an alliance of 90 cities representing 1 in 12 people on the planet and 25% of the world's GDP. The C40 Alliance was started by Bloomberg when he was mayor of New York. This is a uh, and, uh, sorry, and, uh, and uh, originally the, C the original C40 president uh, and funder Bill Clinton. Uh, uh, the picture here is of Bill Clinton with our Lord Mayor Clover Moore. The recent announcement by Bloomberg that he will work with cities to honour the Paris Agreement and fund the US contribution is born of this alliance. The fact that Sustainable Development Goal 11 refers to making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe and resilient and sustainable is another indicator of the focus now being placed on cities. Rapid urbanisation is not the only reason for this focus. We are not being simply included because of the challenges we contribute. We are also being included because we have something special to offer. What cities do better than any other level of government is view challenges through the lens of place or urban policy, which leads to problem solving that considers people in place when designing solutions. For example, reducing emissions in Sydney's CBD is very different to Western Sydney, because in Sydney's CBD, most of emissions come from commercial buildings, whereas in Western Sydney, transport is a high emitter. Therefore, different actions to bring down emissions are, are needed, even in different parts of the same city. Similarly, knowledge about the people in a place, such as age, education and cultural background, influences choices about the most appropriate action. The fact that our leaders sometimes struggle to deal with the tricky problems is partly because the challenges we face don't sit neatly in portfolios, not that they ever did. For example, the problem of obesity does not just sit with the health department, it is also a transport problem, because planning our cities in a way that does not enable people to walk and cycle contributes to poor health outcomes. Public safety is not just a policing problem, public safety is also a design issue. Are the streets well lit? Are the street frontages act activated with shops and community facilities? Are there a range of people of different ages or backgrounds using the city at night? People don't live in silos or portfolios. They live in places. You don't get up in the morning and say, today I'm going to use the transport system, tomorrow the education system, Wednesday health, Thursday I'll go to work and Friday I might shop or go out to dinner or the theatre. You get up in the morning and chances are you will interact with many or all of those systems and services. The ease with which you are able to move around and access the things you need contributes to your quality of life, to the productivity of the economy and the impact on the environment. Good Sydney city planning measures these things like the ease with which you move around, the cost of moving around, the proximity you have to things you need for daily life, the safety of the public domain and aims to design cities to accentuate positive attributes such as physical access. Poor planning leads to situation we have here in Sydney, where many people who earn the least live the furthest away from their jobs and have the poorest public transport and unfairly shoulder the cost of getting around through being forced to use um, user pays toll roads. That's if they haven't given up. Many people, particularly women, faced with the combined cost of childcare and travel, drop out of the labour market altogether. This integrated and systemic approach requires high levels of collaboration. In Australia, not only do we have to combat siloed thinking, but the three levels of government also play a part in the delivery of almost every system, leading to a lack of coordination and efficiency, because we're not that good at working together. So it was with these things in mind that we consulted our community. We took all the information from the consultation and the technical reports and we summarised the whole lot into three words. People said they wanted a city that was green, global and connected. Sustainable Sydney 2030, our city plan, is a story that describes an inner city that is more compact and more dense. A place where people are within walking and cycling distance of most of the things they need for daily life. A place where people are able to live a more public life because the public infrastructure required, such as light rail, pedestrian and cycleways, parks and open space, childcare and recreation centres would be provided. 
We translated what people said they valued and we put it into our, in our community and we developed a more compact city that housed more people in a smaller area that would achieve the environmental, social, cultural and economic outcomes they desired. That we showed that there could in fact be a positive nexus between environmental sustainable city, social justice, economic vitality and quality of life. But the deal is, the social contract is, that the quality of life and public infrastructure would eventuate. That the City Council, in partnership with others, would provide, build, advocate for, and most importantly, protect the public interest as the city grows and changes. We have a logo, it's on the screen behind me, and it's a series of intertwined circles. Sustainable Sydney 2030 has 10 delivery areas and targets, and every delivery area and target has a clear policy, strategy, program and budget to deliver it. And everything, whether it's a policy or a park, is developed in consultation with our community through meetings, citizens' juries, online surveys, formal discussion papers and reference groups. And everything we do is regularly and publicly reported on. So what's in the plan? When our community said they valued a green city, they meant green with parks and playgrounds, flowers and trees. But they also wanted the city to be green in its impact on the environment. This has led to the City of Sydney being carbon neutral since 2011, our solar panel program, the installation of energy efficient LED lights, and most recently our participation in the largest solar <coughs> battery storage trial in Australia. The Better Buildings Partnership, one of our most successful partnerships, includes 14 of the largest institutional landowners in Sydney, many of them here today. By working together, they've reduced their emissions by 47% since 2006, which is our, our City of Sydney baseline, and have saved 32 million in avoided electricity costs. Our Greening City Plan sets the tree canopy target and a program to dig up bitumen and replace it with plants. It makes the city look and feel better. It cools the city. It also, of course, is a climate adaptation um, plan. When our city said they wanted us to be a global city, they were expressing a desire for a global outlook and attitude through partnerships as well as economic orientation. The global programs are developed through the planning we do to increase housing, supply and jobs. We also have economic plans that cover key areas such as retail, tourism, culture, live music, and the late night economy. Central to the global city vision is the work we undertook with Jan Gell and Associates. The aim of this plan was to ensure the ongoing competitiveness of our city by transforming it into a walking, cycling, 24-hour environment. The central feature in this plan is the installation of the light rail, which is un under construction now, and the creation of a new modern main street. Given that the city is long and narrow, the light rail enables people to be within about 500 metres on foot to almost any point in the city. The provision of affordable rental housing is perhaps the greatest challenge we have in this global city program. Although we've achieved a reasonable number of new units, we are still well short of our target that 15% of all housing in the city of Sydney should be community or government owned rent controlled housing. This is a picture of, of, of 100 affordable housing units uh, just opened in Green Square. They are in the same precinct as a new childcare, cultural facility across the road from a new park, aquatic centre and a short walk to the new library and the Green Square uh, railway station. A global city cannot function if the housing stock precludes the many workers that a thriving city needs. In addition, the City of Sydney is very vocal in its, in its belief that if you are on a low income, then you are much better off living in the inner city, where you can live without needing a car, where you can have access to excellent parks and playgrounds, libraries and free Wi-Fi, where you can attend a free event almost every night of the week. And when our community said they wanted a city that was connected, they meant physically, socially and virtually. Our Connecting Sydney transport plan aims to develop what we refer to as the livable green network, a walking and cycling network like the one in this picture. And of course, um, this, this livable green network and this plan influences our acquisition and community facility investment. We're positioning facilities that people need, such as this one, the Surrey Hills Library, childcare and community centre, in places that people can reach through active transport. And of course, these facilities contribute to social inclusion and justice. 
Our new social policy, A City for All, towards a just and resilient city, was launched last year by Mary Robinson, the former President of Ireland and United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. The overarching principle in this policy is an aim to close the gap between rich and poor. And I'm sure that the actions I described above give you a fa flavour of how we are going about this. The Sustainable Sydney 2030 program that addresses our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community is called the Eora Journey. All projects in this program are developed with our long-standing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. One of the objectives of this program is to ensure that the history and contemporary experience of this community is reflected in the design of our city. Perhaps the most significant of our recent projects to achieve this is in Imagine, translated Thou Didst Let Fall, the memorial for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women who served in the armed forces. We also measure community wellbeing. This suite of about 100 measures was adopted by Council in 2012 and uses a variety of sources from census, health data and our, and our own surveys. All of the examples above are the things that the City of Sydney does on public land that it manages on, on behalf of the community. However, the vast majority of land in the City of Sydney is privately owned, and the City's job is to also protect the public interest as development occurs. There are many examples of how we embed values in the documents we use to control the activity in the City, and I'll share one recent example, my final example. Our citizens told us that they value the sunlight. So the City of Sydney planning controls protect sunlight in the CBD through the sun access planes. The new CBD planning controls aim, aim to release in an orderly way 3 million additional square metres of commercial and residential floor space. This is important because people also value economic activity and CBD growth and development must also serve this outcome. But not at the expense of amenity provided through things like sunlight. So the CBD controls ensure sun access. Of course, the property industry understand this. They know that the value of their property comes from its context, and the city context is the public domain. A building in the middle of nowhere has little, if any, value. No one wants to buy a unit or rent an office in a neighbourhood that has no sun or is unsafe or dirty or has no other amenities such as trees and parks, open space, footpaths and public transport. But even though the property industry understands this, of course, when they come to see us with their project, that might take away just a little bit of sunlight or just a few trees or just a sliver of open space or encroach onto the footpath. They argue it's only a little bit, how much can it hurt? But of course, all those little bits add up. And if we didn't say no, over time we'd end up with no sunlight or trees or open space or footpaths. Great cities have strong city administrations made up of public servants for whom the city is their vocation and whose job it is to protect the public interest and not let private interest override. We achieve accountability because we explicitly identify and protect what people value in the documents that we use to manage development in the city. And if our leaders choose to allow private interest to encroach onto public interest, the community can see that this is happening even if they can't always stop it. So to conclude, I've described how the City of Sydney works with citizens to understand what they value and how we go about protecting or enhancing what they value both on public and private land. I've talked about how we use the four pillars of sustainability, but also outlined how we look for integrated solutions that have multiple benefits. I have outlined how this is best achieved by looking at challenges through the lens of urban policy in place and I've referred to the grow and fo growing focus on cities that help tackle global challenges such as climate change. But as I often say to staff at the City of Sydney, if you remember nothing else, just remember this, that what we're on about at the City of Sydney is action on climate and social justice. And if we get those two things right, we're bound to achieve a sustainable Sydney. Thank you very much.